Today we start chapter five, which is covering economic growth and development. So far, we've really learned about some of the, the basic metrics of macroeconomic analysis, right? So, you know, we've learned, well, why we study macro, which isn't really so much a metric, more just kind of a, a motivation for the course. Uh, we've learned about GDP, price indices, unemployment, things like that. So now it's time to take some of those and apply it to various uh, fields within macroeconomics. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be starting out with a somewhat low frequency um, analysis of data, which is going to be the long run growth and development, right? So we're not really so concerned with like, you know, things like the business cycle that moves pretty quickly. We're looking at the, the really slow moving stuff. So the long run trends in things like GDP. Now, once we learn that, we'll obviously be moving on to business cycles, which then is a little bit more high frequency, but I figure start low, work our way up to the high. All right, so that said, let's get a move on, shall we? Let's talk about diarrhea. I love poo jokes. Poop humor is funny. I don't care how old you get. I don't care how much of an adult you become. Poop humor is always funny, at least if you're me. Now, in America, if you get it, okay, you're the, the butt of a couple of bad jokes. <laughs> no pun intended there, I promise. Um, but eventually, you know, if you get in America, you know, you get like some Pedialyte, you know, maybe take some some Imodium or something. Maybe you're, you're a little embarrassed. You don't really want to tell anybody, you know, you had diarrhea for a few days. I, look, I get it. Um, but overall, you know, that's kind of the, the that's the extent of it, right? Um, but if you get it in like a less developed nation, you got a problem on your hands because, you know, <laughs> more poo humor. What keeps you clinging to the toilet in the United States will actually have you clinging on for dear life in a much poorer less developed country. If left untreated, it can kill you. Um, now, it tends to kill the elderly and the kids. Um, now, in terms of what this means for economic growth, well, if the elderly are killed off, the economy can still grow. The society can still grow because the elderly have kind of like already done their part for society, right? Consider them having been retired. Not, of course, to justify that, like, you know, it's somehow okay to kill the elderly. It's not at all. But when we're talking about the impact, the long-run impact on the future of a country, which is going to be worse, the elderly or the children being wiped out? Obviously, it's going to be the children. We need the kids to be alive so that they can contribute when they grow up. So when it's time for us to retire, our kids can take the reins, they can take over, and move on with the world. So really, you know, in 30 years, they're, they're going to be running things, or at least they'll be starting to run things, right? We'll, be, we'll sort of be handing over the reins for that institutional power. And a society without any kids is a terrifying one that is well, bound to die. If you ever see that movie, I think it was called like Children of Men or something like that. Fantastic, fantastic movie. Um, something very similar to this. People just stop having kids. And it, it shows sort of the decline of society when people just stop giving birth. Um, so we need kids for our economy to be able to grow. Now, when we're talking about growth, right, what metric are we going to be using to define economic growth? And I mean, really, there's there, there are a couple that we could be using. But um, the one that we're going to be mostly interested in here right now is the increase in real per capita GDP. Now, I know the slideshow only says per capita GDP. It's real per capita GDP. Because if you've got the growth in nominal per capita GDP, well, it's the exact same thing that we talked about in chapter, what was it, three, I believe, on inflation, where if you've got prices going up, it'll look like the economy's growing, when really all that's happening is things are just getting more expensive. So we're going to want the increase in real per capita GDP as a metric for economic growth. Now, when it comes to looking at that, right, it's really a question of how rich are we, right? How rich is the average person? And when we look across countries, we'll see that some countries are richer than others, right? In America, we are very, very, very fortunate. Per capita income is very high in America. And as a result, we have, you know, a lot of Android phones. We've got a lot of other nice things, too. We have a lot of nice cars. Uh, for me, you know, nice guitars. God, I love playing guitar. It's awesome. 
Um, we have excellent infrastructure. Infant mortality is very low. Now, I, I actually would like to come back to this at some point, maybe not in this lecture, but at some point, because it is a wonderful example of how statistics can be manipulated. Um, but we'll, we'll get back to that later. Infant mortality in the United States is incredibly low. And it's on par with a lot of other first world developed nations. Aside from that, we have a stable government. I, I know it doesn't always seem like it, but when you really think about it, right, our government is pretty stable and there's just a lot of noise on sort of the, the fringe sides of these debates. And education is also pretty good here. Now, I know people watching this are probably going to be like, oh, well, you know, it's the worst of me. If you come to America and you go to a public school, you will get a quality education and you will be able to succeed in the world. So if you want to say we're 50th or we're 90th and whatever, be my guest. You come here, you're going to get a good education. Now, in other parts of the world, one Android phone might be shared among the entire family. So instead of mom having a phone, dad having a phone, and the you know 2.3 children having a phone each, so it's what? 4.3 phones in the house. Instead, it's one for everybody. And infant mortality isn't exactly that great in a lot of these less developed countries out there. The government sometimes isn't really all that great. Sometimes it doesn't allow them to talk poorly about the government, or the country, things like that. People might be a little worried that, you know, about the next time their government's going to kill them in mass numbers. And they probably don't have access to any good education or possibly any education at all. So why is that? Why, why are some countries richer than others? Well, that's actually a question that's been plaguing economists since, well, we've been studying these types of things. And there are a lot of reasons why. There's no one sole reason why, well, you know, this, this country is poor because X, Y, and Z. There are a lot of things that feed into it. The, the answer is never as simple as just one particular cause. Now, the United States, as I said, we are very fortunate. We're one of the richest countries in the world, and we are 25 times richer now than we were in 1820. So that means for every dollar that your great, 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 great grandparents had, all things constant, you'd have 25, and that is an increase in real income, not nominal. So if, say, your great, 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 great grandparents had $4,000 in annual income, all things constant, you would have $100,000 in income. And again, that is real income. That's not nominal. So that's holding prices constant. So this is pretty astounding when you really think about it, right? If we had to ask ourselves about which country we would want to model to see how they grew over time, right? What is, what's an example of a success story when it comes to economic growth? Well, America would definitely be near the top of that list because, like I said, we're one of the richest countries in the world and we have been for a very long time. But here's the interesting thing. We started out poor just like everybody else. Every country starts out poor. Now, I mean, I know, okay, now it's like, well, you know, say there's a civil war or something and one country separates from another one. Well, that country just started. They may have all the infrastructure. I'm not talking about that, right? I'm talking about like the beginning of time, right? Everybody starts out poor. And it starts slow, right? Go back to the times with cavemen, right? They had to start out with like rocks and all that stuff. But then eventually somebody invents the wheel, and they go, hey, cool, this thing rolls. Uh, they probably didn't say it like that. Probably like weird guttural grunts or something. I don't know. I, I, I don't know how cavemen spoke. I wasn't, I wasn't around back then. Right? But somebody invents the wheel, and that thing rolls around, and it's pretty cool. But here's the nice thing, right? Even after they died, the wheel was still there. Right? So even after the inventor of the wheel has passed away, the idea of the wheel, the concept is still there. So then someone can come along, they see the wheel, and they go, hey, you know what? I'm going to put four of them, I'm going to take four of them and attach it 
to this little flatbed thing, and then guess what? I can wheel it around, and it's stable. Well, now you have a cart. Fast forward a little bit more, you get people living in civilizations together. You get farms, domesticated animals, you get the horse and buggy. Eventually you get governments and religion. And then somebody figures out they can use a small metal tube packed with explosives, and it propels stuff out of it, and it can kill things. Hunting now gets way easier. Self-defense gets easier, right? Somebody sees that, likes it, and does their own twist on it. And that happens with all sorts of things, right? Somebody saw the the horse and buggy and was like, hey, that's kind of cool. What if I take an internal combustion engine and fix it to the buggy? We don't need the horse anymore. And then somebody sees that and goes, hey, that's really cool. What if I can do all sorts of cool things to that, right? And then we get, you know, all the nice fancy cars that we have today. So somebody sees something, they like it, they put their own twist on it, they build upon the idea that was already there, right? But then kind of backing backing up a little bit, right? We get some renewed interest in the sciences, You know, we get mathematics, physics, astronomy, we even get economics, right? And all of these academic studies had to start out somewhere, right? They had to start out from basically next to nothing, and they could be built upon themselves as more and more people enter the discipline, learn about it, and then contribute their ideas, their take on things to what has already been there. So growth really compounds upon itself, implying that ideas appreciate. Now, physical capital will depreciate, right? If you buy something, if you buy some product that you want to use for your company. I know I use like restaurants a lot because I used to work in a lot of restaurants. So let's say, you know, you buy a new grill for your restaurant. Well, that grill's not going to last forever. It's going to eventually fall apart, All right? It's got like a, a shelf life, so to speak. And eventually, it's going to fall apart, and you're going to need to replace it and get new stuff. But with ideas, they don't fall apart, right? You're not like, huh, well, uh, you know, I got this this cool, um, like, line system of preparing food in the kitchen where I've got, you know, a couple of guys working the grill. I got a guy working the fryer. I got somebody making salads. I got somebody else making desserts. It's not like, you know, in a couple of years, that idea is just not going to work, right? You're not going to be like, oh, well, you know, it worked yesterday, but it doesn't work anymore today. No, that idea is still going to work. Now, if you get new capital, you get new things, okay, maybe you might need to change that up a little bit, but the idea itself, the core idea is still there and it's still workable. So ideas will be appreciating. And we can take these ideas that people came up with and they may, you know, we can expand upon them, right? Every time I want to run a linear regression, I don't need to sit there and prove the ordinary least square solution to be able to estimate it. I can just take it, run with it. And, you know, if I happen to feel really awesome one day and if I get super smart out of the blue, I can develop some new estimation technique. It'd be really great, but, you know, Hey, we all have our limitations. So because everything grows based on what we did in the past, right? we see growth on itself. So if we're getting economic growth that's compounding upon itself, this would imply that growth is actually exponential, not linear. Exponential growth would imply that the growth rate of real per capita GDP is increasing at a constant rate. Now, when you hear constant rate, you're probably thinking linear, right? Constant, straight line, something like that. That's not actually to say that it's linear. If you think it might be linear, right, that grows at a constant rate means linear, right, what that would actually mean is that we would have equation one here, right? This is really nothing more than just y equals mx plus b, right? You get the future value of real per capita GDP, yt plus 1, being equal to gamma naught, which is your constant, right? For y equals mx plus b, it's that little b term, plus gamma 1 times yt, that's the, gamma 1 is the slope, yt is the independent variable, which is, you know, today's value of real per capita GDP, and then you get that epsilon t, which is just like the error, right? It's the difference between what gets estimated and what we end up actually getting. So that's just a straight line. It's a straight line with a little bit of error attached to it. 
So that would really mean that for every year, we would add the exact same amount to what we had the year before. But that would also imply nobody's building off of their existing ideas. So in order to actually build off of existing ideas, we need an exponential growth process. The exponential growth process is what you see in equation two. It is y sub t plus n, right? So per capita GDP, n number of periods into the future being equal to one plus the growth rate, gamma, to the power of n, the number of periods in the future that we're going, times y naught, which is the initial condition. It's the starting point of per capita GDP. And you can use whatever starting point you want. It's not like, well, it has to be the first recorded point for per capita GDP. Not at all. All right, it can be 1950, it can be 1960, it could be, you know, 10 years ago, whatever, whichever one you want to pick, right? That's just your initial starting point. Now, you might be going like, what's the one plus gamma there for, right? Well, if you were to expand that out, let's just say it's one period in the future. And if you were to expand that out, you'd get why not plus gamma times why not, right? So that why not that first why not that you have, they're just the one by itself. That is equal to basically the what what our starting point is, right? So when I say growth compounds on itself, right, you would have all the ideas that you got today plus some new ideas, right? That gamma times why not would be like the plus new ideas. So we have one plus gamma times why not. And that one plus gamma is raised to the power of n for the number of periods that we want to go into the future. So if it's just one, well, it'd be to the power of one, and then it's, you know, yt plus one equals one plus gamma times why not. Now, when we look at exponential growth, right, this is real per capita GDP between, I believe it's like 1945 or so up to 2018, I think. I think it was the last time I had updated this graph. Now, I mean, I could have gone up to 2023, but we're looking at like long run trends. And of course you'd see the weird hiccup from the COVID thing. And like I said, we're not so interested in like business cycle stuff. We're more interested in like long run trends. So really adding a couple of years isn't gonna make a ton of difference when it comes to the general shape of the, um, of real per capita GDP over time. Now, if you look, it's not really following a straight line. It's got kind of a, like an increasing at a, it looks like it's increasing at an increasing rate, right? It's growing at a constant rate. So this is telling me, okay, GDP growth is not linear. It's exponential because we have ideas appreciating upon themselves, thus exponential growth in real per capita GDP. So let's do like an example of this, right? Maybe maybe an example would kind of help uh, explain things, help things get solidified a little bit more. Suppose the economy is growing at like 2% per year and our starting year's per capita GDP is $10,000. What would per capita GDP be in one year? Well, we just take equation two, what we had, and I'm going to plug in $10,000 for why not, one for N, and 0.02 for gamma, right? Because it's 2%. So I would get yt plus one equals one plus 0.02 to the first power times 10,000, right? I evaluate it, I get $10,200. But for the year after that, it's not gonna grow by another $200. That would be linear, right? It's growing by the same rate, not the same amount. So the amount that it grows by will be different. So to compute that, I gotta plug in two for n, right? And everything else is going to be the same. And what I'd find is that yt plus two is $10,612.08. So the economy still grew by 2%, but the amount that is growing grew by 2%, right? Because it's compounding on itself. Think of like interest, right? Compound interest. It's the same idea. And it works for any number of years. So you could just plug in how many years in the future you want to go and see where the economy is going to be then. But not all countries are going to be growing at 2%. Some grow way faster, some grow way slower. Unfortunately, some grow negative. So how are we going to find that growth rate? 
right? If we want to look at historical data, how are we going to know what the growth rate is? Well, all we really need is just GDP over two different time periods. So I get, say, yt plus one minus yt over yt, right? New minus old over old. And that gives me the growth rate in real per capita GDP, right? Suppose per capita GDP in 2016 in Turpestan was 12,000 uh, catnips. And in 2017, it was 12,800. And we want to know how much per capita GDP grew by. Well, to answer this, right, I take YT, set that equal to 12,000, YT plus one is 12,800. And we now have enough information to find the growth rate gamma by using equation three. So I just get new minus old over old. I evaluate it, I get 800 over 12,000, 0 0.066666, repeating blah, blah, blah. All right, so that gives me 6.66%. And that's pretty fast for economic growth. Probably not gonna be sustained economic growth because usually what happens is economic growth tends to hover around the two to 3% range, at least for the developed countries, right? We get times where we're below that, times where we're a little bit above that, but for developed countries like the U.S. or, say, Turkestan, we're going to get a nice average long-run growth rate of about 2 to 3%. Now, let's talk a little bit about some of the less developed countries but and their growth rates. However, I want to get into some growth facts before I really jump over to what some of the less developed countries' growth rates are like. Because countries that are richer have been growing exponentially for longer than the poorer countries, for the most part. Which means they've had more time to develop. And any countries that are behind, right, that are not as developed, are behind for one of two reasons. Either one, they were late to the party, or two, they haven't shown up to the party yet. I guess three, it could be like a combination of one and two. They're late, and they're not even really all there yet. But it's one of those reasons, right? They're either late to the party, or they haven't shown up to the party yet. Doesn't mean they won't, just means they haven't gotten there yet. So countries that were late to the party started growing, but they're just behind the curve a little bit. And countries that haven't shown up yet are much, much further behind. Now, between 1960 and 2010, the U.S., U.K., France, and Germany all grew at a rate of about 2% per year. So it was a nice, sustained rate. And as I've said before, most developed countries grow at this rate. So let's now talk about two different types of growth. The first one is cutting-edge growth. This is the growth that we see in the United States. It's what developed countries are experiencing because we're on the cutting edge of research and development. And to be on that cutting edge, we're going to make progress, but it's going to be slow and steady progress. As opposed to, say, catching up growth, which is what developing nations are experiencing. And you get this when you're late to the party. Now, when you're late to the party, you have access to all the ideas that other people came up with, right? We can consider South Korea and Singapore. Both countries were incredibly poor in 1960, and they're very prosperous now. They both grew at a rate of almost 5% per year. And now Singapore, it's one of the richer countries in the world, and it's also lauded as one of the freest economies in the world. And that's awesome, right? Think about it. In like 60 years, they went from being incredibly poor to one of them being one of the richest and freest economies in the world. So countries that experience catching up growth, they have access to all of the ideas and technologies that were developed by these already developed nations. They've got access to that technology so they can use it and incorporate it, and they catch up very, very, very fast up until the point where they reach the same level of development as the more developed countries, and then their growth rates slow down to that 2 to 3% range that we see for more developed nations. So the countries that are experiencing catching up growth, right, they're growing at a faster rate than that 2% that the U.S. gets, 
right? That doesn't mean they're smarter. It doesn't mean they're better. It just means that they've had access to what we already developed. So once they catch up, their growth rate is going to slow to that of other developed nations, right? Because there's a difference between the level and the rate of growth, right? The level of their per capita GDP, their real per capita GDP, is very, very, very low when they're experiencing that catching up growth. So the growth rates will be tremendous, but their per capita GDP is still going to be pretty low. And as their per capita GDP increases, and as other metrics for economic well-being increase and begin to converge to those of the more developed nations, their growth rates are going to slow down substantially. Now, we've covered that. Excellent. Is there a way to really classify what good and bad growth is? Because, like I said, you know, some grow really fast, some don't grow at all, and unfortunately, some countries even grow backwards, right? And the point of growth, right, and what makes a country a growth miracle is to make future generations richer than yours, right? You want your kids or your grandkids to be making way more than what you're making now in real terms. And if that doesn't happen, that means you're either going nowhere, or you're not growing at all, or you're going backwards, which means that you're growing poorer instead of richer, right? If you're making more money at, say, the age of 35 than your kids are when they turn 35, well, that means that the economy's been growing backwards. And I'm saying this on average, right? Not like, you know, let's say, I don't know, you're some high-level executive for, you know, a very, very, very large multinational corporation at the age of 35, which is awesome. If, if you get to that point at 35, hey, good for you. And, you know, your your kid is doing something that's earning less, right? That's different, right? That's more job choice. I'm talking about on average. So if you are the average person and your real per capita GDP is higher than that of your average child, then you get that backwards growth. You're growing poorer instead of richer. Now, if your country is getting poorer over time, obviously you're not an example of a growth miracle. Instead, you're an example of what's known as a growth disaster. And there are, unfortunately, numerous countries out there that are growth disasters. Now, when it comes to economic growth, right, a lot of times we'll wonder, how long is it going to take for an economy to double, right? How long is it going to take for real per capita GDP to double? And if... We want to answer that. We got to make a couple of simplifying assumptions to use this equation for here. Namely, if we hold the growth rate constant, then the economy will be doubling according to a rule known as the rule of 72. And the rule of 72 says that the time it takes to double per capita real GDP in an economy is 72 divided by the growth rate and then multiply the growth rate by 100. This is all because of exponential growth and decay stuff. So if you've taken differential equations, right, this is that first order separable differential equation type stuff. I mean, this is, yeah. If you take differential equations, this is kind of where that's coming from. So the format that it follows is that the time to double is equal to 72 divided by gamma times 100. And if we plug in some growth rate, say, you know, 2%, right? 72 divided by 2 would be, what, 36 years? So why am I using gamma times 100? Well, because remember, gamma is that decimal, like 0.02 for 2%, right? We're going to need gamma times 100 to get 2. And it's absolutely vital that you remember this, because if you forget this, it's going to take a really, really, really long time in your calculations to double per capita GDP, which isn't what's seen in the data. So if Gamma is equal to 2%. It'll take about 36 years. I don't know why I said 35, 36 years to double per capita real GDP, in which case it means your children will be twice as rich as you were. And so now we need to ask, does the data fit this? Well, we can look at some real incomes. 1982, it was a little over $27,000. 2017, it was just shy of $53,000. So it's just a little bit a little shy of doubling, within 35 years, right? So in 35 years, per capita GDP 
has doubled. That's awesome. Really makes it a pretty great place to live, let's be honest. So that's going to wrap up Chapter 5. So it kind of, you know, ends the, the introduction to growth. And, you know, growth is really an important, like, topic in macroeconomics because it's looking at this long-run dynamic behavior of an economy. So not only do we get to learn macroeconomic principles here, we also get to learn about some dynamic mathematical behavior, right? We get to learn how choices today will be affecting um, outcomes tomorrow or a year from now, whatever, you know, the... Um, the frequency of the data is. And this, those two things, right, the, the macroeconomic principles of growth and the mathematical, like, dynamic behavior is going to help us explain how some countries that were once poor aren't anymore and how some countries that were once poor still are. And we've also seen, and we can see a little bit more later, that some countries can catch up in their growth if they adopt certain policies that help them grow a little bit better, which which is nice, right? So if it's a country that's not particularly well off at the moment, they will at some point, if they adopt certain policies that are a little bit more conducive to fostering growth, they can grow, they can catch up, and eventually they can be just as rich as the other developed nations in the world, which, you know, as the slide says, is very nice. And I agree since I made the slide. So with all of that said and all of that out of the way, I will wrap up this video and we will start on chapter six in the next lecture. Thanks for watching.